Hello and welcome to January 2022's uh, Live Practice Clinic. Um, I'm Graham Fitch, I'm the co-founder of the Online Academy and what we do every month is uh, have a clinic like this where I sit in my studio and address questions that have been sent in by Online Academy subscribers on various aspects of practicing and of course this will involve technique as well. Um, nice to see you Frankie. Um, do let me know where you're all calling in from, uh, watching from and do please hit all those lovely um, like buttons and if you're watching on YouTube please press the subscribe button and uh, you will be informed of all of our um, uploads as we do them. So it's Viv, I am seeing you. Hi Viv, nice to see you there. Uh, I think people will start to join in gradually as we go along. So let me kick off with the first question, which is uh, from Jan in, in Frankfurt. Um, and Jan says, Dear Graham, after a long break, practicing the piano has been immensely helpful to me in getting back at the piano and finding a new approach. Thank you so much. Yeah, and that means a lot to us um, to know that what we're doing, the resources that we offer are helping so many pianists. That's the point, <laughs> that's what we want. Um, I have been working on Brahms Intermezzo in B flat minor, opus 117, number two, for a long time, but I'm still struggling with all those passages in demi semi quavers. How should I deal with the tension caused by all those stretches in both hands, Jan asks. And then he gives some examples of, of stretches. Now, you see, Jan, the problem is that we don't want to, uh, to, to make stretches. We want to avoid stretches uh, wherever we can in piano playing. And when we do need to make a stretch, um, we don't approach a hand position from stretched. Um, um, let me just play the little bit of the beginning of this. Uh, <laughs> saddest pieces I know in all music. It, it cries from the very first note. Three notes that fall down for Brahms seem to signify farewell. Um, I hear them at the beginning of opus 118 number two. In the alto. I wouldn't bring them out like that but uh, those three notes that descend. Now, Jan, I think, I think what I would like to uh, show you, um, and I'm going to start off with the, the left hand group because I think it will be a bit more visible. So uh, Brahms has asked us in bar, uh, the first complete bar, to play this. Now, um, okay, so I can see that it could be intuitively correct to say, well, I've got an E, an F, a B flat and an F, that's one hand position. Let me see if I can put my hand out into that stretch position and just move the fingers. Well, if you do that, you are, you are going to be very uncomfortable. And it's also not really how we want to, to play. We don't want to play with fixed positions and then moving the fingers. What we want to do is to keep mobile. So if I can show you what I would do, if I were to play each note by itself as a separate uh, gesture, you, I would find that the way my arm lines up behind my hand changes. And this is the clue. So if I now join from this position to this position, my thumb is nowhere near the F yet. Now I'm moving to the second finger. And you see, then I make a, a transitional movement to get me from here. And what I'm doing now is playing it backwards and forwards. Can you see how my thumb does not lock into the F position, but I mobilize, and I can do that very fast if I needed to. I don't need to do it very fast here. So it, it would be the same with the right hand, not in one position and then in another position, but 
you see how I move? Move. Move through the wrist. So I need quite a lot here of lateral freedom in my wrist. And you could even feel this opening in the right hand as, as little circles. Up. Can you see those wrist circles there? Now in the next bar, well, it's actually in the same bar, we've got that stretch from the thumb to the third finger. Now I have a big hand. I don't have a problem um, stretching that uh, third thumb to three to make that connection, but notice how I do it. Um, when I'm ready to go, I move, but then immediately let my thumb come back in to join the hand. So the stretch looks like this. See if I can show you it on the back of my arm. And close, not keep stretched out. So as soon as I've made this, the, the stretch, I close my hand. So my ideal is to keep a closed hand wherever possible. And when I do need to make movements, stretches as you might call them, then I make the movements at the last minute and I reform my hand. So my hand closes it again immediately. Um, there are other problems with this piece uh, and Jan has asked uh, about the arpeggios in bars 24 are difficult for me to control and to play in time and blending them in with the pedal. Yes, th this is problematic. And you know what, um, the, the question that's coming up about the Chopin Nocturne, it, it comes down to organization rather than just busking through and just hoping that some days the pedal will do a better job um, of the connections than others. It's, there's actually um, a very precise way of organizing the fingering and the pedaling and the releases when we hold, when we start the spreads. See, let me just show you the passage. sad isn't it? Uh, okay even though it's in the major. Now what I've got here in front of me the Henle Urtext edition, the new Henle Urtext edition with fingerings by Andreas Boida which I think are very good. Um, what he, he asks for here in the left hand three substitutes to a five and then three two substituting to a five thumb and then he has five, I would do three to five. So I'm making my left hand as legato as possible by hand. It's not difficult to do, it just does take a little bit of organization. Now let's look and see how um, the, the, the pedal works with the spreads. So um, uh, let me just take it from the, the beginning of that section. No problems yet. I'm going to change my pedal on the lower F. If I change my pedal on the upper A flat, I will have lost the resonance from that F octave. And that's, I don't want, I want to capture the low F in my pedal. So if I go from the previous position, now what I do is I play the F and change the pedal and then immediately let go of that thumb because I've, I've caught it in my pedal. I don't need to, to be stretched out. I've caught it in my pedal. And then my left hand, change pedal on the D flat. In all likelihood, you'd want to change there. Now you may say, well, but you've lost that tenor F. I have lost it, um, but I've got these two notes ringing and I had enough of that tenor F to register. So nobody's going to notice that there's nothing left of that F at that point. Change. Now here, this is easier, but again, put the spread on the beat. In other words, play the low G flat together with your left hand chord. Now here again, change pedal on the lower F. Change. 
Now what I do is I take the low D flat here with my left hand and the low B flat with my left hand. So I avoid the issue of the stretches in the last two chords. So did you notice that it's all to do with how I time my pedal with my hand and consider putting the, putting the spreads on the beat, not before the beat, in order to catch all of the notes of the harmony in the pedal. Great, and I can see there, Gosia is, is coming from Poland. Nice to see you. I'm, I'm squinting it at an iPhone here, which is set far enough back so that my, you can all see my hands. I can't always see what's going on on the screen, in all honesty, but I do see hello from Poland with a nice heart. So that's great. So I hope that will have answered your question there, Jan. Um, moving now to Dylan, who asks, how is Baroque touch, Baroque touch, different from other periods and how to teach it to students? Well, it's actually quite interesting. I, I feel that Baroque touch or touches are, are just as, uh, as colorful and varied as say Debussy's uh, touch requirements. The, the, the difference is that Debussy writes them out so that we're left in no doubt as to what touch we need to use. Is it an, a, a very much legato, legatissimo? Is it mezzo staccato? In other words, half length, half silence, half of sound. Um, it, we, we're left in no doubt when we look at the music of the later composers. The difference is that the Baroque composers don't usually write anything much by way of articulation marks or so uh, that does not mean to say that we uh, play them all staccato um, there's a, this erroneous belief that because baroque music needs to be played staccato or something silly it does not at all please do not replicate the sound of the harpsichord use the piano as as a piano play pianistically but i think if i can give you a few thoughts on this because it's a very important subject we have to come up with our own ideas on articulation, touch, as, you, as you, we call it. Um, and I've got in front of me a little handled gavotte in G. Um, uh, if people who like to know these things, HWV 491. It's a very simple two parts, one in right, one in the left. can show you the, the score. Do you see what's there? It's There's no markings of, of any sort, apart from one slur, actually, uh, or, or, or a few slurs, I should say, uh, there, but we apply that. That's kind of obvious, I would have thought, um, to, to connect those uh, paired, uh, quavers paired eighth notes. But at the beginning, in the left hand, I've got quarter notes or crotchets. I played it all legato. That's boring because I'm playing it all staccato. So what we want to do is, is I call this degrees of separation and degrees of connectedness. So some notes are going to be more connected or even connected and, and other notes are going to be separated but not necessarily staccato as in short. I mean when we've got an octave jump like that, that in all likelihood, we'd probably want to separate uh, a little bit. Now here I've got two notes that are close together, three notes. I could connect them if I wanted, or make a little gap in between the F sharp and the E. So I've got short, short, but the first note is longer than the second. Can you hear? It's not equal staccato. So and, and in the right hand I've got two eighth notes, two quavers, to a crotchet and then how could I articulate that? What would be the touch there? 
Well, it could be detached. Um, or it could be slurred. Or it could be slurred that way if you wanted. Um, so if I put that together, and I'd probably want to put a little bit of ornamentation in there as well. Um, maybe on the repeat to do a little bit more of that sort of thing. And just as there are no dynamic markings here, I would want to add my own dynamic markings based on what? Based on cosmetic reasons? I haven't had a piano for a while, let me stick in a piano. No, based on structural reasons. So for example, the first phrase seems to want to open up to the high, high point, and then it closes to that low point. So I would make a little crescendo diminuendo. It's just kind of obvious. Uh, in the second half, there to the relative minor. What could I do there? Well, I, I could either make that more intense, uh, the, the cadence. Let me try. Or I could make it less intense, play it softer. Let's see. think it would matter which one I did but I'd need to do something there to show the colour of E minor. It's a different key, it's a different flavour, different colour. So uh, that's one example. Um, I wanted to just show you a, a little kind of practice exercise that, that, that can be helpful for this. I'm going to take a five finger position and whenever I deal in five finger positions I like to use the whole tone position from E and then black keys and then C or B sharp if you want to, 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 to think of it that way, just because it fits the hand better. Now, a, 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 what you would call a vanilla, plain vanilla legato is where I release my thumb as my second finger goes down. Right, so the previous finger comes up as the next finger goes down. Okay, nothing special about that. Now, I'm going to do now an overlap. So I'm going to uh, add a count to this. I'm going to count one and two and. One and two and three and. Now on the and, I release the previous note. So I've got here a legatissimo or an overlap to my sound, which we need a lot of the time in Baroque music. And I'm going to come onto that in just a second. But we can also have uh, degrees of staccato. Let me do now counting in four, one, two, three, four. And I'm going to go, do three quarter length sound. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I've given there three quarter sound, one quarter silence. And then I can do half. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And I can do quarter. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So all of those different possibilities for uh, connections and degrees of separation. But I, I, I probably should get on to the next question, but I, I, I wanted to show you, I don't have it here, but um, I think I can probably remember it, a little bit of the Bach C minor little prelude, which I think is BWV 999. Uh, this, this little charming little piece. <laughs> that in 16th notes or semiquavers in the right hand uh, so that if I played it um, as reading it through 19th century eyes I would probably play this which is very noty and very clonky now given that this piece was written for the lute originally transcribed from the lute um, the lute doesn't have dampers so these notes would ring on now on the piano, we can, if we want, pedal. Down, and then up probably 
here. But if we don't want that, res that amount of resonance, um, then we can overhold the fingers. Did you see what I did there? Let me just show you that again, slow motion. Instead of lifting up the C when I play my E flat, I don't, I hold on to it. And I hold on to my E flat. Now I need my E flat again, so I release it partially, just to the sounding point, and then the same with the C. So I've, I'm connecting these notes to themselves, tying them to themselves. Now if I put that together with my left hand, what I get then is a harmonic moment followed by a rhythmical moment. And we can apply that sort of touch thinking to other things as well. I'm looking now at the C minor prelude from book one. Oh. So maybe a little bit of overhold here. Now this is quite a subtle thing. Um, a harpsichord uh, player's touch is incredibly subtle. Please don't think that the harpsichord is incapable of expression or that they just have to stick the notes down. They, the touch is incredibly um, refined. Uh, a good harpsichord player will absolutely be doing all of these things and, and much more. So uh, I, I hope that addresses that question there. Um, Vidya now asks, can you please walk through the rolled chords in the Poco Piolento section of Chopin's 48 number one nocturne uh, and video specifies bars 27 to 37. Um, right, there's no absolute one way of, of playing this. If you listen to different recordings of this piece, you will find different versions, different ways of negotiating the rolled chords. But what we've got here, um, this is the nocturne, this is the start of the nocturne, one of the most incredibly beautiful things. interested in old recordings there is the most astonishing recording of Myra Hess who we wouldn't associate normally with Chopin but the most incredible recording of her playing this particular nocturne do search it out I think it's on YouTube or at least it was on YouTube a while back um, now the the section that Vidya's asking about is the poco più lento it starts off more, more or less straightforwardly start to get a little bit interesting. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to give you a general principle here um, so that you can come up with your own solutions. It's very important that we keep the melodic line as connected as possible. I'm playing uh, just from the end of bar 28. Uh, okay, so the, the, the phrase has already started actually, but let me just play from the end of bar 28. This is the melody line. And that line has, mar has been marked with a phrase mark. A little breath there. Breath there, so we can make a. We don't want to make a silence, but we can make a, a break in the melodic line. However, if we break uh, the melodic line when we've got this big phrase mark, we really do disturb that line, and it's it's untenable. We can't do that, so we've got to keep that line as connected as possible. So again, um, I'm going to show you. I don't like to call it a trick. Um, but it's it's like a, a, a trick of the trade, if you will, or a, like a conjurer who, who tells you how they do the magic. So what I'm going to do here, if I change pedal here on this C, I catch 
catch all of the notes of the spread, but I lose my melodic line. I, I lose time. I want to hear that sixth. So the only way of, of preventing that from happening is to keep hold of that G, only the G at the top, as I change pedal here. So what that does, listen to that. You hear yum. you hear every single note in the spread. So now, it, it, that's okay because the G is actually in both chords. It's in this chord and it's in this chord. What about here where, where the top note E is not in the next chord? May I do it here as well? Well, let's see. So here's my, I'm gonna hold on to my top E. It works, now hold on to my top D. And what I get then is a completely smooth legato line and I change pedal on the bass note, on the bottom note of the spread, not on the top note. If you try and change it on the top note, you'll lose all of the harmony. Um, that method works extremely well. Now you may be thinking, well, hang on a minute. So he's saying I can put the E, it's gonna get caught up in this next chord. Yes, it, it does, but we don't hear it. It, it, it has died by then. So what we're, what we're dealing in here is, I wouldn't like to call it the lesser of two evils, but it's a compromise, but it's actually an artistic compromise because I, I keep the full resonance of the spread chord and I keep the melodic line and nobody hears the dissonance. <laughs> everything so that's uh, I, I could have done that better if I'd sat and practiced it for a bit um, I was lazy this morning and I didn't sit and practice it I could do, do a better job than that but I think that gives you the idea of, of how you can proceed with that um, also just to say that some spreads uh, are written only in the left hand if I'm looking at bar 29 it's only those notes that are spread and that's together other times the spread goes all the way up from the bottom to the top. Other times we don't have any spread marks at all. Um, where I'm looking at the second chord in bar 29. So we've got this monstrosity. I can't play it all together, but I could. It's this. My left hand has to manage that. But I could break it. I don't necessarily have to spread it. I could break it. I could break it in two ways. I could either play the the bottom two notes first and then the top two notes or I could play the bottom note and then the upper three notes um, there's various ways of, of, of organizing that so ask yourself is it a spread and very often it is or is it a possibility of a break uh, am I connecting my melodic line am I changing the pedal from the bass note and if you work with those principles you'll find your way through it video Okay, my last question today comes from, okay, from Martin. Martin says, thanks to your walkthrough of Bergmuller's Opus 100, I'm currently learning La Pastorale. I have some problems with the grace notes in bars three and five and can't play them fast enough, so I can't keep up with the general rhythm. Could you advise me on how to practice for that? Okay, Martin, yes, let me just uh, show people what the, the pastoral is. Uh, so the little acercatoras, um, and we've got a slide note before. So if I play it, uh, let me play it at the tempo. All I'm doing is slotting in the little note just before the beat. And do you see, I, I'm always after mobility in my hand. I wouldn't try and do that with my fingers like this. That's really tight. Um, can you see how I'm phrasing that? So these two notes just get tucked in together very lightly. And then now here, 
before the bead. And like any ornament, an ornament is designed to enhance its surroundings, not make life harder. So if you think of a, a, an ornament you might wear, such as a necklace or a, or a brooch or an earring, something like that, um, it, it can be very discreet. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be obvious and it it doesn't have to be super fast either you know you can caress those notes let me do that better give them a little space um just before i wrap up uh, martine had mentioned that the the walkthroughs of bergmola opus 100 in the Online Academy, we have the whole series, uh, Opus 100, where I give uh, little teaching notes on each one and then a, a detailed video walkthrough on each of them um, to outline the challenges and the solutions and the interpretive and technical issues that come up. And related to Dylan's question about the Baroque, uh, we do have some in our library of, uh, of recordings of of workshops that we've done on the online academy we do have a couple of uh, baroque uh, special uh, workshops and i'd just like to suggest again i can recommend very much this book that's put out by alfred it's a publishing company i like very much uh, it's very um, educationally very very good um, and this has plenty of pieces on the baroque and also plenty of diagrams and, and performance practice and just generally a very good thing for the piano teacher to have on the shelf. Um, so yes, I think that's everything today. Thank you so much for your questions and for your attention at listening now. And um, I will be back in February with the next practice clinic. See you soon. Thank you so much for watching.